I'm Jim. I'm a photoholic. I uh, took my first picture when I was five. I became addicted at 12. And I've been suffering with the disease ever since. So this is an especially memorable moment for me to be able to, uh, to moderate this panel. Um, I, I think that it, uh, it might be one of the funnest things I've ever uh, put together in my life. And so I'd like to thank the Milken Institute for exploring this. This is 175 years of photography. That's a long time. And in the last 10 years, it's changed in ways that none of us ever thought it would. Uh, and it's going to continue to change at a very rapid rate. So what I wanted to do was put together a panel of some of the leading voices in photography and the study of photography on the human mind. To my left is Joe Tree. Joe is the CEO and founder of Blip Photo. Uh, it is a collection in 178 countries of people who are documenting their life day by day, one photo by one photo. And it's something that we at Imperial Capital, where I'm a managing director, believe is the wave of the future. We call it the slow web. He also is a British Academy uh, film award winner for the concept that he and his team came up with at Blip Photo. Tom Monroe is CEO of Photo Bucket. Photo, I think, in my mind, uh, really created the photo preservation, photo organization, photo sharing concept uh, long before others came along. Tom has a very, very uh, deep history in the photography industry as well as software. Linda Henkel is a professor at Fairfield. She has one of, been one of the only people who has studied the effect of photography on the human mind. Uh, and does it really help us remember? And does it help us remember accurately? Mark Lubell is, um, well, my whole life I wanted to be a magnum photographer. This is, here, touch me. <laughs> well, I'm this not, is a, I am not a magnum. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I know. But Ma Mark was the head of magnum. Uh, that's the closest I'll ever get to being at magnum. Uh, he is. Uh, now the director of the International Center of Photography in New York. And uh, I think he has a really unique uh, view on photography taken as a whole, everything from the elite artists down to uh, all of us carrying our cell phones and taking pictures. 800 billion to 1.4 trillion photos will be taken this year, Mark. Does the ubiquity of photography the presence of it, maybe the over-obsession with it, has it changed the value of photography in society? Well, um, it's definitely changed. I mean, we, our society is definitely changing uh, because of uh, these new forms of communication. Um, and uh, photography has been a major driver in this change. Uh, technology has changed photography, and photography has changed technology. So. Uh, the way we are communicating with one another is completely changed. Um, and, uh, you know, you can take different positions. You can put your head in the sand and say, okay, uh, I just want to remember photography for the way it was. Or you can embrace this and, and see um, that this is not going away. You know, unless there's a solar flare and knocks out everything, um, then uh, maybe we can go back to a, a previous understanding of photography. But, but uh, today's world is, is changing dramatically. And I think the opportunity um, is your slide of 100, uh, 800 um, billion images. I think it's actually 880 billion images will be taken in this year. Uh, my question is, who's making sense of this? And who's, who's, who's going to be the arbiters of this conversation? And who's going to go in there and ask the tough questions and challenge that? And, and I think there's real opportunity. And I've seen some fantastic uh, photojournalists, the traditional photojournalists that went out on the world to document the world and come back and tell us what is happening in the world. I've seen some of those same photographers go onto Instagram now and begin to edit by hashtag of a major events that are happening in the world, not their own pictures, but, but to, to try to pull out um, important narratives of today and try to make sense of that. Now that's a social documentary. Uh, there, was a, there was a conversation uh, in this room a, a panel before um, saying that the credibility now is who you are. So it doesn't mean that that picture was yours, but if, if, if someone is following you on Instagram, it's, it's not only your own images that are valuable, but it's your own personal narrative and who is connected to you is almost as important as the image. So uh, I think everything is changing, but I, but I don't see this as a terrible 
you know, downfall of, of, of civilization. I see this as an amazing evolution and opportunity. Tom, you have a unique perspective because how many photos do you have on your system? Uh, about 15 billion. 15 billion photos. <laughs> and, and, and your company has done this for a very long time. Since 2004. Okay, so before Instagram, before Snapchat, before the rest, what have you seen if you just looked at the, the context of uh, the history of what's happening in imaging for the people who share your photos on your, on your system? Oh, absolutely. The, there, there's a whole bunch of different trends. Let me see if I can distill it down to, uh, to a few. One, um, the majority of our photos historically, when you look at in 2003, 2004, and 2005, th they're coming from point and shoot cameras. And, uh, and what we saw is really with the introduction of the iPhone that all of a sudden uh, there was a huge switch. And the number of photos and the number of uh, photos coming from um, smartphones uh, escalated and, and grew quickly. Uh, today over 65% you know, of our photos come from smartphones. Joe, you're on the different end of the spectrum. Explain why you've put the constraint that only allows people in 178 countries where you're in existence to only post one photo per day. Okay, I think I'll answer that by talking a little bit about pers my personal history. So when my grandparents died, they left behind boxes of photographs. My, those photographs are at my mum's house. They can exist, we, uh, I can, I can like 10. touch them. Um, similarly, my mum has done exactly the same thing. She has a complete history of my childhood in albums in the house. And when she steps off this mortal coil, those photographs will be there for, for me to go and put my hands on and my brother and my sister. I became a dad myself um, seven and a half years ago. And in that time, I've taken 80,000 photographs. If I, if I continue at the rate I've, I've been at for the last few years, I'm gonna, and I live to the age of 80, I'm gonna leave 500, sorry, I'm gonna leave half a million photographs behind. For, uh, who's gonna try and make sense of that? So for me, that's a, that's a huge issue. Um, for most of us, the images that do make it off the devices which they're taken on, and I think that's one of the figures that's kind of masked in that 800 billion, one trillion images, those are pictures that are taken, not necessarily pictures that are ever put anywhere or, or shared with anybody. Um, the, the few that do make it off our smartphones, could we, could we bring up slide 13, please? Make it onto Facebook, and Facebook in less than 10 years has become the biggest archive of photography that humankind's ever known. It's, currently storing well over 350 billion photographs. And this diagram kind of puts that into, into scale against Getty Images, which is the, biggest, the world's biggest commercial photo library, the Library of Congress and the BBC Photo Archive. It absolutely dwarfs these other collections. Now, I think as society, we should be really excited by that for the first time ever. Ordinary people have these devices in their hands. They're capable of taking incredibly good photographs, but they put them on Facebook. And Facebook's not a great place because it's not open, not everybody can see it. It's very badly indexed, and will it be here 50 years from now? Um, can we move on to the next slide? So here's, a, here's an example image from the, from the Library of Congress, one of its most prolific images. This is, has historical value because you know where it was taken, you know who took it, you know what format it, it, it was taken on. It's cross-referenced against other images, and that's really what gives it historical value. And if we, by contrast, flick onto the next slide, this is, this is the kind of stuff that typically finds its way onto Facebook. Um, there was a study in the UK a few years ago which found that alcohol was a factor in 76% of the photographs that are uploaded to Facebook. Now that probably says something about my fellow countrymen, but I think it says much more about the, the way that we share our photographs. It's about sharing, it's not about remembering what's happened. It's not about protecting something for, for, future, for future value. And Blip Photo, that's really where, where the idea came from. Um, I think it's wonderful that people take more photographs than they ever have before. I think it's wonderful that we all have the capability to do that in our pockets all the time. But we need to stop once a day and just think very carefully about what we're actually going to keep and record and is going to be accessible to, to our future generations. So I, I've been doing this for close to 10 years now and I have one image to represent every single day of my life and some words to go along with it. Just one, one final point I wanted to make is that um, we're not alone in recognizing this is an issue, it's a huge growing issue. In, in the UK, the British Library, who are our equivalent of your Library of Congress, 
see this as a massive problem. So much content is working its way onto the, onto the internet and isn't being kept anywhere for future generations. So last year, an, an act of parliament was passed in the UK that allowed them to start indexing web content to keep in their vaults for future generations. And number two on the list of sites that they decided to keep and index every single day was, was Blit Photo. So that's kind of testament to, to some of the things we're trying to work towards, I think. Tom, you have uh, also an organizational aspect to your ph photos. I mean, you really, if you sign up for Photo Bucket, you, you talk about the importance of organizing your photos, and you have keywords and, and so on. Um, and when I started shooting film, I shot 36 <laughs> images maybe a day. Uh, they were expensive, they were hard to process. I can now shoot 36 in about six seconds. Uh, and I go home and I throw them onto my hard drive and I'm like, what do I do? How do we, how do we make sense of the quantity? Yeah, it, and you're not alone in that. In fact, let's throw up um, slide 35, if we could put that up. So, so uh, Infotrends did a study uh, a while back, I think it was a year and a half ago, and what they determined uh, when they surveyed people that photos and videos were the most precious items people have. Uh, but what we've also found in that same survey is a good portion of us don't back up those photos. And then on top of that, a good portion have lost photos. And so it's about one out of three. So a third of this audience most likely has lost digital photos or videos. Um, and you know, when we look at uh, photos today, um, I, I, I look at it two different ways. You have the art of photography and you have capture. And today I'm wearing a, a device which is capture. So every 30 seconds this little device is called nar the narrative clip will take a photo. So over the past two days at this conference I've been walking around and I, ha I will have 2,000 photos. So that even exacerbates your problem. <laughs> it, so what do you do with those 2,000 photos? How do you organize them? How do you back them up? And then how do you rank them and preserve the ones you want to keep? And that really is what Photo Bucket has been doing in the last couple of years. A simple way to back up all your photos from any device, to get them in the cloud, to preserve them, and then to give you tools to easily organize, select, and prioritize those photos. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question of all of you. How many of you take photographs? How many of you take photographs of your children's birthday, your father's birthday, or your wife's birthday? Why do you do that? To preserve the memory. Linda, does that work? <laughs> well, it would work if you actually took the time to look at the photos afterwards. And, and this is something that, that you guys are both working on, making sure that people have accessible ways to do that. But the fact is, people take photos so mindlessly, and they don't look at them afterwards. And if you don't review the photos afterwards, it's not going to be able to cue your memories. So I had run this research study um, at the Bellarmine Museum of Art at Fairfield University. So if you throw up slide 33, and I had people go around to different works of art, and some of them they would take a photo of, and some of them they just looked at. And so they might look at the mosaic there, or they might look at the statue or take a photograph of it. And then a day later, I brought him back to the laboratory and asked him to remember specific visual details about the objects of art. I asked them, do you remember seeing this on, on the museum tour? And they remembered fewer details and remembered fewer objects of art if they took a photo of it than if they just looked at it. And basically what it suggests is that if we're counting on the camera to remember for us, if we treat it as this external memory storage and we outsource our memory to it, we don't engage in any additional processing of those experiences. So if we treat photos as trophies, there's the Mona Lisa, got it, what's next? That's not really going to let you live in the moment and, and have that experience. Photos can be wonderful memory aids, but you have to look at them afterwards. And so, so just taking photos doesn't benefit memory, and in fact can kind of set up a mind frame of, I don't need to pay attention, the camera's gonna remember for me. So in your study, you actually had people zoom in on an individual piece, which meant their human eye had to look and recognize what they wanted to zoom in on. Yeah. Was that that caused it, the fact that you caused them to look at the actual work, not necessarily the photo itself? Right. So, so if you go to slide 34, I ran a second experiment where I had people just go up to the objects of art, line it up and take a picture of it, 
or zoom in on a particular detail. So the second photo there shows them zooming in on one of the animals. The third photo shows them zooming in on the head. And I actually found that if you took the time and interacted with the object of art, for the ones that you zoomed in on, you didn't get this photo taking impairment effect. Your memory was just as good as if you had actually looked at it. But what was especially interesting to me was that your memory is not the photograph that you've taken. If you zoomed in on the feature of the object, you had as good memory for the feature you zoomed in on is for the feature that you didn't zoom in on. And I always tell people you, you can't compete with the human brain. The human brain can be looking at something but thinking about the entire object. I'm zooming in on the goat and my eyes are looking at it, but I'm thinking about this entire mosaic and what it means to me. And so I can get that kind of memory, memory benefit then if you take photographs in a more mindful way, a more focused way. Um, and and I, th I think it's a really important thing just for you know, everyday users to, to think about those hundreds of photos where we're just collecting trophies and showing off. You know, if you're if you're doing it for those reasons, great. You know, narcissism or just sharing with friends, bonding. Those those all are you know functions that you may have. But if you're doing it for the purpose of memory, you may want to rethink your strategies. Mark, uh, every chance I get, I go through your gallery, your your museum, and. Um, there's some remarkable pieces of history in there that, from times that I didn't understand, um, I wasn't alive or wasn't aware of, of things that happened in the 70s or the 40s or the 50s. And so when I walk in there, I walk back in time. Um, and obviously history is a big part of the, the ICP and a big part of photography. At the, at the risk of, uh, getting to the point where uh, people get so inundated with photographs. Do you worry that those that are documenting the special times of today are going to have less relevance going forward than Robert Kappa did on Omaha Beach? And can we, can we cue slide uh, 22? Um, well, it's definitely a legitimate concern, but um, I think photography I think there's a lot of things we have to break down in this conversation. Um, first of all, there's two billion camera phones right now, and in a year and a half, there'll be five billion camera phones. So if you're gonna talk about numbers from 880 billion images taken in a year, that number is gonna triple or quadruple in a, in a short period of time. Um, but uh, photography was always about communication and about a distribution of that communication. So if you go to uh, uh, Matthew Brady, Matthew Brady was a, the civil rights, civil war uh, photographer. He would come to Gettysburg three days afterwards. He would set up his tripod, long exposure, take those photographs, you know, uh, develop them the next week. Three months later, people would actually see what was happening. Then you get Robert Kappa. Robert Kappa is jumping out of a transport on D-Day, taking photographs, live action. Uh, Steven Spielberg used for Save It Private Ryan the film strips of Robert Kappa to, to position his camera to really understand what was happening. But when Robert Kappa was taking those pictures of D-Day, two days later, the entire world saw those pictures. Well, now I flash forward to a photographer named uh, Michael Christopher Brown. He uh, was in Libya. Uh, his traditional camera uh, uh, jammed up. And so he started to grab his iPhone and he went around and he was taking pictures with his iPhone and he was bringing his audience with him because he was posting them onto his Instagram account. And uh, as he was in the moment, he was actually taking, the, taking an audience and, and, and bringing them through. So um, yes, I am concerned that we are being influenced by so many images and, and where, are those, where are those iconic images? And I'll throw the question back, I can throw it back to the audience. Does, does anyone, can anyone think in the last 10 years, what is the most important image that is, that is really stuck with anyone because we're getting so many images? I would say Abu Ghraib was an image that was, you know, that, that really changed the world in perception. And who took that picture? And where did that picture come from? It wasn't a professional photographer. Um, it was camera phone by, and it wasn't supposed to be seen. <laughs> so. Um, I, I think uh, there are still going to be iconic images that will come into and, and will change people's perceptions. Um, where they're coming from is, is going to be questioned. But I think there's a lot of new vehicles 
for a professional photographer to get that work out. Um, and that is a real challenge in today, but I think it, that's also a gigantic opportunity um, because the story can come out, but it can come out in many different ways. Joe, what are your thoughts on that? What I've, what I've seen happen uh, again over the last 10 years is photography diverge into these two different steam, streams. It's become either about sharing or about saving. And the way that most people use their cameras is to share what they're doing in the present moment. So I, I, I take your points completely, but what we're, what we're doing with our cameras now is taking pictures of ourselves and sharing them, and they're, they exist and they're forgotten just as quickly. And Snapchat's almost the ultimate evolution of that, that we take a photograph that's so disposable that it self-destructs five seconds later. Um, so I think, again, I think that's a really interesting road that we're on, but we're doing, there's a huge cost to that, which is that we aren't saving, we aren't protecting the images that are most important to us. Um, I mean, Jim and I were talking about this morning, and, and one of his daughters sent a picture, a Snapchat picture, and it's a beautiful picture taken by his daughter for Jim. That should be a special moment that Jim wants to treasure, but as soon as he sees it, it's gone. And I think as a society, we, we A, have this huge opportunity to collectively tell our history you know we all have the power now to tell the story of what all of humanity is doing we don't have to leave it up to the powerful people anymore but actually all we're doing is pointing the camera at ourselves and grimacing slightly and sending it to our friends and then it's forgotten and for me that's that's very sad I think, I think there's i think there's photography and i think there's communication hmm. and i think when you talk about generational i mean what a, a 12 year old is doing a 15 year old and an 18 year old is completely different which which technologies they're using and how they're using it. And basically, there's photography in a traditional sense and from a historic sense, um, uh, and then there is communication. And what is happening right now, I mean, when you start to think about it, we used to call people on the phone. Now, who wants to call anyone on the phone? Because you gotta do that dance for like two minutes to be like, hey, how are you? Uh, what's the weather like? You know, that, that's, that's two minutes of your life that you can't deal. So what do you do? You text that person. You send that message because it's direct and you say, hey, what's going on? Well, that's what's happening with image making and it's visual culture. It is not photography the way we sort of understand the definition of photography. It is, hey, I'm wearing this. Don't wear this. I'm wearing this, you know, <laughs> or hey, look at what I just ate. That's delicious. I, I, you know? I and, and, and that is a different form of communication than what you know, when you think of the definition of photography and what a lot of people, you know, uh, love about photography. I, I, I agree completely. I mean, photography has become, for most people, a form of instant communication. And, but young people think they're taking photographs, they think they're engaging in photography, but actually they're communicating, as you say. And five, ten years down the line, they look back and what do they have? What, what memory of their life do they have? You know, can you go back, back that far on your Instagram stream and do you want to? Does that tell, tell you anything right, about and can you who get you are as a person? 80,000 80, images, exactly. you won't. Exactly. And some of the dangers of that, though, is with the doctored fo photographs. You know, we treat photographs as if they're a version of reality when we're talking about documenting history. If you just throw slide 31 up, it's, it's just a really quick example. Um, you know, so the Egyptian newspaper going back a couple years ago when President Obama had visited there, um, they had run a photo that had been doctored, and the New York Times had shown the actual photo, which is the lower one. President Obama is clearly leading the pack, walking down the hallway there. And the Egyptian newspaper didn't want to show that. They wanted to show their president more in the position of leadership, and, and they doctored the photo. They were literally altering history with these doctored photos. And people do this constantly in their everyday lives. Um, there's a great research study, if you flip to slide 32, where they actually had uh, students from the university contacted their parents and had them bring in photos. And unbeknownst to the students, the researchers would take a photo and doctor it. And they would put it in a scene that the child to the, be the, you know, the, the college student to the best of the researcher's ability, parents report, had never experienced. So they would see three photos of real experiences and then this hot air balloon ride that they never went on. And there's a picture of them with their uncle in the hot air balloon ride. You ask the people, hey, do you remember this event? And at first, oh, I, I, I don't know, it seems a little familiar. Well, just take the photos home with you. I want you to keep trying to remember, keep trying to think about the event. We think photos are always real. 
Less than two weeks later, you got more than half the people coming back saying, I remember that hot air balloon ride. I was so scared. I went up. I cried. They'll elaborate. They're creating false memories because we think photos are veridical versions of reality. And now with photo editing software, you've not only got the, the media doing it, which is incredibly troubling, right? Photojournalists doctoring photos so that they can tell the story they want to tell instead of documenting, you know, what, what, what's really going on there. But in our everyday lives, we're changing. Oh, let's make it look like it was 20 years ago. What effect does that have? If we look at photos and we treat them as if they're a representation of reality, then, then what value do they have when we're altering them like this? Uh, th that was one of the best quotes I ever heard about Instagram when it first rose to popularity was how pissed off would we all be if all our parents' photographs looked as if they were taken in 1920. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's true, we're, we're doing these things because it's fashionable now, but 20 years down the line, will that, will that make sense to anybody? Yeah. Tom, it's been reported that you're such a thorough CEO that you view every image uploaded on your system. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have a broad spectrum to look at, and on, on this idea of, of uh, not only doctoring, and we'll, we're going to come to, to a little bit about uh, you know Photoshop in, in, a, in a minute or two, but with respect to the context of this conversation, how do you how do you how do you look at uh, the aspect of memory, the photographs really being important to what Joe's trying to do, or what Linda's talking about, or what Mark has talked about, really just where you can look back at it and say, this is my life. Yeah. Well, rather than focus on you know the, the two or three photos that individuals you know want to preserve, you know, Photo Bucket tries to bring your whole portfolio together so you can then organize that over time and prioritize prioritize those photos. Um, and, and really, like like the camera I'm wearing today, just it, it used to be that w there was a fairly high barrier to photography because you, want, you wanted to capture a moment. And you had to go, you had to get your camera, and you had to you know, work to do that. Um, but now what we're finding is that barrier is so low with a camera phone. But does that make it, w which is right, right? Are there more moments that we didn't capture historically that we would have wanted to capture? Or is it the other way around? And our premise is, you don't necessarily know in five years which moment is going to be the most important to you. So theoretically, what we're trying to do is, is let's get all your photos together so you can choose later in life and then look through that. And, and when you have that full composition, it's, I think it's easier to not distort the memories when you, when you see it over time and, and you can kind of build that whole portfolio together. And, and that's, you know, that's the effort that Photobuck is trying to do. Linda, if you went back and did that study two years from now, um, do you believe that people will look at photographs differently? Do you see anything changing with respect to uh, how, how people are utilizing photographs? Because we have convenience now. They're always, it's very easy to take a photograph. There's more to look at. Um, do you see anything that's going to uh, change the course of the importance of photograph uh, photography and really frankly the, the accurate historical perception of what it what, what it stood for well I mean, I, I don't know what exactly the future holds um, but but certainly people you'd think people are savvier now that they'd realize how easy it is to doctor photos right but we're all as naive as the person sitting next to us, and, and we tend not to think like that. We assume that the pictures in the newspapers are accurate versions of what really happened there. Um, and in some ways, I think that's a kind of nice aspect of human nature, right? To assume people are telling the truth, and these photos are veridical versions of what's going on. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that's going to change much. That particular study, though, I know it's made its way into intro psych textbooks, the one with the hot air balloon ride. I didn't run that one, by the way. And now the subject pool is no longer naive. They, they know, oh, if you show me a fake photo of a hot air balloon ride, I'm, I'm too smart to fall for that. But it's like, so okay, so we'll just use different photos and they'll probably fall for that. Um, I, I think there's something so compelling about looking at a photograph. It feels real. It helps transporters back to that moment in time. Well, it's, so It's very emotive. 
Yeah, and so, so when we look at those photos, and I think over the course of a lifetime is where photos change in their meaning to us. You were saying how you know, some, sometimes the photos, you don't know what's going to be important, and then later on, things, things wind up being you know, you know, a, a friend who passed away unexpectedly, and you cherish those photos more than ever, or, or just something that represents something about you, and, and it captured something at that moment. And so, so I, I, think, I think a documented life is, is a valuable life to have, but um, I, I do think that there's dangers in assuming that that's reality. <laughs> now, since we're talking about, I'm sorry. sorry I was going to say that there's, a, there's another theme emerging here, which is about the way that we reflect on our own selves. So you spoke a little bit, Mark, about the constraints that used to exist about having to wait three months to get a photograph. And even with Kappa and the Omaha Beach, there was a, a two day period of time. We used to have that same thing in our own lives. So we would mm -hmm. shoot 36 pictures on film. We would have to wait to see them. We would then go through those pictures and choose which of those pictures to go into the album. We would then revisit that album many, many times over the course of our life. And at each of those stages, we're, we're kind of reflecting on on ourselves and our experiences. And I really think that that's one of the ways that we tell ourselves who we are by reflecting on our experiences and what we've done. And again, by a photograph becoming an instant thing that's gone as soon as it's arrived, you kind of lose that. You're, you're losing that point of stopping and reflecting. And with us, very few people will post their image on Blit Photo at the time it's taken. So the, the iPhone, is by far our biggest picture, our biggest camera, just just like you guys. But not all of our pictures are uploaded from the iPhone. People will take their iPhone pictures home. They'll put the kids to bed. They'll look through their images from the day. Then they'll pick one that means something to them, write something, and post that. And that's the, that's a process of reflection as well. Yeah, and the the social aspects of it, I think, are really interesting to think about. So so if I had a photo album of my of my trip and I sat there in real time with you and showed you, oh, remember when we were at Global Conference and remember we did this and we did that, you would be adding to that. Or if you weren't there and I was just showing you something you had an experience, you would interact with me. Oh, that looks interesting. Oh, what was that about? We would have a dialogue and that kind of reminiscence is what strengthens the neural connections that is the substance of memory. With things like Facebook, like, that's all I have to do, and that's my level of social interaction with you. And, and that's very, very different. And so I think we're losing a lot of the kind of shared, it, it sounds funny because we're able to share so much more now and with so many more people, but the sharing experience is so much shallower than, than it, it had been. And, and that, that loss of the depth is, is losing some, some of the value. There's nothing like sitting down with your siblings or parents and looking at photo albums and reminiscing. And they remember different things about that day because only some of that day was captured on film. So you know there were other events that happened that, that, that weren't photographed. And, and that, that to me is a really valuable part about personal photography yep. that, that I think we're losing. But you know, in the same, we talk about all, the, all these images, what does it mean? Oh, we're getting lost, we're getting lost. We're being swamped. But you started out by saying, you know, you started this whole site because uh, when your grandparents passed, there were boxes of photos in a shoebox. It's the same thing. You know, nobody had gone through that or nobody had organized it before. It's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's just now it's on a scale side, it's, it's much larger. But still, this idea that we were photographing and then, you know, developing this and then sitting around a table and talking about it, you know, a month later or a year later, that didn't really happen as much as, you know, um, uh, as, as we'd like to think it happened. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many archives there are of, of famous photographers or not famous photographers that their work ends up in closets and shoeboxes and well, cabinets. I, I don't know how many you follow the art photography world, but there's a woman named Vivian Meyer who has hit the Great scene example. in a very big way. It's one of the most extraordinary stories. I, I would implore all of you to, to look into Vivian Meyer. She was a nanny in New York City and Chicago for some wealthy families. And uh, she carried a Roloflex and a Leica and she took pictures. And she shoved them in shoeboxes, mostly unprocessed. Um, and uh, w w w towards the end of her life, she became personally bankrupt. Those things went into a storage locker. And a man in Chicago stumbled upon you know, these the storage wars. He bought the contents. He looked at it. He knew enough about photography. He put four images or five images that night on Instagram. He got 1,000 likes. He put 10 more. So then he called. Um, the gallery at Weinstein, Weinstein Gallery. Howard uh, Greenberg. Uh, Greenberg, yeah, Greenberg Gallery. And he said, I think I got something. 
Well, her art is now, she's dead. Uh, it's going for extraordinary amounts of money. Uh, I know that some places are thinking about doing an exhibit. She took pictures for herself. She shoved them in a box nobody ever saw. I just find that phenomenon amazing. And now here I want to take an Instagram and boom, <laughs> there it goes. So that's, how, that's what's changed. Um, uh, Mark, you've followed Vivian and the, the, the history that's evolved over the last two years about the history of the last 40 years in her life. Mm -hmm. What's your thought on that? Well, I mean, you know, I'd also like to go back to doctoring photographs. I mean, uh, and that's what I was saying before about, you know, who we're following. The image is important, but where that image is coming from now is equally important. And there's a crowdsourcing me uh, mentality, too, that you are going to accept this person's image or believe this person's image by who it was followed by and, and the personal narrative of that person. So I think that's very interesting. And a lot of professional photographers don't want you to see their original negatives when they went to the dark room because they lightened and darkened those images because they wanted a specific impact for the user to have. And remember, they understood the medium in which they were, they were distributing that image. Um, Halsman is a great example of a photographer. You cannot see his negatives because his final uh, product was uh, on a black and white newspaper or, or a black and white print. And he did a lot of great work. You could call it Photoshop, but he did a lot of work in the dark room to make that quality image and make that image impactful. So I think understanding who your audience is, is, is uh, uh, through the history of this medium has always played a big factor. Um, I just wanted to. So I want to pause because this is re very relevant to this conversation. Then, Tom, I want you to pick up on this. Can we run video, uh, slide number nine, video number two, please? Please watch this. It's 54 seconds. It's a, for anybody who has a teenage daughter, it's a pretty remarkable video, and I'll get to that. Tom, what's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd need another panel for that. <laughs> we would. Um, you know, we, uh, our users do a significant amount of editing. Um, it, I think we get you know, two, three million people editing every, every month of photos. By the way, your software allows you to edit. Yeah, our software does allow you to edit. And, um, but what, what I don't see is much of what that video had. A lot of it is maybe putting text on a photo, maybe a watermark, maybe you know, kind of adjusting color contrast, uh, some simple things, adding filters. Uh, but that, you know, to change the image and, and, and basically uh, alter the entire impression and meaning of the photo, at least on the everyday basis, I don't see that. Where I worry about it the most is, is the impact on young children thinking that the people really look that Barbie perfect. I also worry about it in photojournalism. Magnum, which you oversaw for many years, this was a collection originally started by nothing but photojournalists. Mm -hmm. Some of the most remarkable names that have ever existed. The Chicago Sun-Times last year laid off every single photographer on their staff. One of the Portland newspapers did and one of the London newspapers did. Mm -hmm. They're encouraging people in the streets to take pictures and send them. As a person who's worked extensively for many years with photojournalism, what's your comment on that? My comment is if you're going to start a revolution or try to overthrow your government, make sure you have iPhones. <laughs> because whoever can get there first and get that story first mm -hmm. is going to be picked up and and, and somebody's gonna take that side based on the images that are coming through. And that's what that means. I mean, there's no context. And, and I, I think this is a pendulum. I, I mean, I think we are going to a full extreme right now and it's gonna come back a little bit. 
but I think uh, the business model of newspapers and magazines was not being supported the, uh, uh, because the revenue left, because classifieds and, and advertising left, so they started to cut down, cut down, cut down. Um, but uh, I agree, it's, it's a big issue in terms of journalism um, and credibility. Uh, and I think people are navigating uh, to find credibility in stories, uh, but it's, it's an issue. So, but Mark, I, when I was in high school and college, I worked for two newspapers to try and make some uh, money to buy equipment. And I could I'd ask what the storyline, what I was going out to shoot, and I'd try and follow the storyline. But I, there were times that I was tempted to take a picture that maybe deviated from the storyline. Now you throw on top of it, I could have visually edited it into something that might not have existed, to, to your point. Do you worry about the accuracy of photography in the, in the context of history or photojournalism? Well, I, I think that the idea of the concerned photographer, and this is a, a, a concept that Cornell Kappa used, the concerned photographer. The concerned photographer went out in the world, found, and this is important, found impactful, important images, and brought them back and either distributed them through a newspaper or magazine or showed them in an exhibition or had a book. I mean, these were the, the distribution points for that, for that work. Um, but the photographer was very conscious of looking for and finding images that were going to make a difference. Uh, so, you know, I could take a picture of this panel right now from up here or down this way. I, I could make us look different, you know, based on where I position my camera. So there's always been uh, a bit of trust by the public that that journalist is a filter. And, and they are trying to take a photograph to tell us a story. We, we trust them that they are following the storyline, but the way they are telling that storyline um, uh, can deviate because they're trying to, to, to make a point. That's always been the case in photojournalism. Right? Linda, you have done a study in, in, in the area of how photography affects the way our minds reads the text. Yeah, so, so there, there's a couple studies actually that come to mind. One I want to just mention that I didn't run, um, Darren Strange and Marianne Gary had run it. They had people read a newspaper story describing a hurricane that had hit a town. And they ran it either with a photo of the town before the hurricane or the town devastated by the hurricane, showing the damage. And people's memory was shaped by that. So they remembered there being more damage than the newspaper article had actually stated if they saw the photo showing that kind of devastation. And uh, one of the studies that I had done was just looking at how people draw inferences when they're reading and if you see photos that are supportive of those inferences so if it talks about the woman carrying the delicate glass vase and she tripped with it and it doesn't actually say that she broke the glass vase but if I put a picture of a broken glass vase next to it people have very hard a hard time discriminating between what actually was said and what they inferred now you add the photo in there and the inference is as strong as could be they'll switch where up and down, they'll testify in court. This is exactly what I heard, or exactly what I read, or exactly what I said. And that's one of the dangers when our memories are being shaped by the things that a respectable journalist might just be for the emphasis, you know, altering, altering the lighting or the shading or things like that, or, or just putting a photo in there that exhibits a particular point. Um, and it does, it, it shapes what we subsequently remember about things. But when, wouldn't you say, you know, we just, uh, in November was the 50th anniversary of the assassination of JFK. If anyone remembers that election, which was fixed, um, JFK just won. He just won by a tiny, tiny, narrow thing because of his father who influenced Illinois. Um, uh, when he was assassinated, 85% of Americans said they voted for JFK. <laughs> yeah. So our memory plays tricks on us all the time based on the information we want to think about. Yeah, and we swear we've seen video footage of things that there's no video footage existing of it. They've done studies, people, oh, I saw the video footage of Princess Diana's car crash. It's like, no, right. you didn't. <laughs> um, and and people, people will remember things. Our imagination is so vivid that when we have a memory for something that we just imagined, we mistake it as something that actually happened and we attribute it to reality instead of our own imagination. Mm -hmm. Joe, I'm a member of your community and, and um, spend a, probably more time than I should on it, given what I have to do at work. But you have uh, really stressed putting words with photographs. Absolutely. And sometimes they're horrific photographs, mm. if I may say, but beautifully written words. Mm. Um, 
sometimes they're both together. Talk to talk to us about your uh, you and Graham's concept of attaching context of the words with the context of the photograph. I'm I'm a firm believer that. I think no photographs, powerful photographs, exist in history. You can pick me up on this if you want, Mark. They ex exist in history that don't have some sort of context around them, whether that's being part of a longer narrative of photographs or being accompanied by words and narrative that, that, that's written alongside it. For us, that's a hugely important part of what we do. Um, it's not just about the image. The image tends to convey the, the, the mood and the emotion but you'll find out a lot more detail about, about this under, underneath the, the, the shot. There's one, one slide in particular. Can we bring up slide 24? So here's, here's a great example. If we look at that as a, as a photograph in isolation, it's a nice photograph, well exposed of an attractive looking man with a beard sitting at a table. Um, fine, we look at that, but if we read the text that's underneath it, what we find out is that this man is walking from South Africa to Egypt and he's following in the footsteps of someone who did exactly the same route 20 years ago and the woman whose kitchen he's sitting in is a member of our community and he was walking past the bottom of, the, of, of her garden and she invited him in for a cup of tea and find out about his story and it transpired that the guy who'd done this 20 years ago also stopped at the same woman's house and, and had a cup of tea and this, <laughs> this chap who's pictured was elated to find this out. Now take the words away and that, that you don't get any of that discussion or, or context at all. So for me, I think it's a really, really important thing. And, and on blip, people do tend to write. Our average number of characters per image is 240. So it's more than a tweet, which in terms of attention span in today's world is a, is a huge amount of content. So and you have no limitation. Vital. You can write 12 We have no words. limitation at all. And what happens underneath the words is that a conversation begins. So the, the, the image sets the mood and the emotion. The words give it some context. And then this conversation develops around it. So this image here probably has 50, 60 comments where people were talking about this experience and the, the, the photographer responding. And you allow people to comment on each other's photos and to even comment on their own, correct? Correct. And, you know, just to back up what Joe was saying, if, you, if we have a photo and it has even one word of commentary, it's many times more likely to be shared and many more times likely to be viewed after a 24-hour time period. So <coughs> just the value of adding a little bit of commentary significantly increases the value of a photo. And I, I, that was my point before with Instagram. And uh, by the way, I'm not a loyal, I have no deal with Instagram. <laughs> um, I just put that out there that there's, there's a dynamic between the image, who is following this person, and the text. And I think that combination um, is what actually gives credibility to, to the storyline, um, but uh, is actually demonstrating that the image itself might not be as important sometimes as the text or who that person, you know, the storyline of who took that picture. This is outdated by now, Instagram. 200 million users. Yep. 20 billion photos shared. 60 million photos shared daily. 70% of the members, 140 million people log in at least once a day. <laughs> Percentage of users that check Instagram multiple times a day, 35. Percentage year-over-year -year growth of Instagram mobile apps, 66%. Number of daily Instagram users, more than 75. And here's the one that gets me. Uh, average daily Instagram, uh, excuse me, uh, average number of Instagram photos posted daily right now is at a rate of 55 million. This is December, it's probably 20% higher than that. Why is this 800 pound gorilla so successful? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's 67 million pictures a day on Instagram. But um, uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look at Facebook, Facebook was one of many social media sites at the time. There was one in Colombia, there was one in Virginia, and they were all about the same. Uh, when, they, when Facebook began tagging photos, in one month's time, Facebook became five times larger than their next competitors. And you look at what company did they buy? They bought Instagram for uh, $1 billion two years ago. Everyone thought, a billion dollars for 12 employees? That's nuts. That's <laughs> absolutely crazy. How could they do that? They're so stupid. This guy, Zuckerberg, is going to be crazy once that company goes public. Then what did they buy? They bought WhatsApp for $19 billion, 10% of the value of the company. Well, WhatsApp uh, has 500 million pictures uh, being uh, uploaded on it per day. Um, so my argument is, uh, and listen, they bought it for many other reasons, but um, my argument is that 
images is is one of the sort of the glues of social and that you and and it's and and you can see that by facebook and why they they're buying these companies that have such a stickiness with with images because that is what is driving the social communication well i mean i would absolutely agree i mean photo bucket was really the first place where you could go and sim you know in a simple fast manner you yep. know put a photo on the internet and then you look at what Facebook did is they put a social network around that and you know, allowed you to add commentary. Right. And, and they grew. And by the way, I think Joe and I would take a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us from uh, that to the depths. I want to talk about selfies. Um, <laughs> can we cue slide five? I want to show you a quick evolution of photography. Slide five, please. This is... Uh, the first photograph of a human ever taken. You'll notice him down. He's tying his shoe on a fire hydrant down in the lower left quadrant. Can we go to six? To me, the photographs of all photographs I just saw two weeks ago on the Pompidou um, for the first time in, in a larger <coughs> format. Henry Carter's Bresson's uh, uh, Dere la Guerre Saint Lazare. It's uh, probably credited as being the one that most coined uh, decisive the decisive moment. Later we find out it might have been staged, but who cares? It's still a phenomenal, phenomenal photograph. Number seven, a selfie. <clears throat> Look in the back on the bridge. It's a man attempting suicide. This woman in New York knew about it and decided to selfie that. Um, yes, yes, and later in the New York Post she admitted that she knew it and she didn't see the big deal. Luckily the police saved this man's life Somebody had the sense, I don't know if it was her friend or a journalist, I've heard both conflicting stories as to whether it was uh, captured of her capturing it to show her uh, audacious behavior or whether her friend thought it was funny as well. And then I want to pull up, excuse me, one more slide. Um, oh, I know. Uh, slide 28. The Oxford Dictionary word of the year and probably the most viewed picture of all of 2013 the selfie of uh, three leaders of the world of the free world so what is causing this narcissism and it, it, is it narcissism who wants to take a stab I'll, I'll answer very quickly I think it's this crazy need that we have to tell people what we're doing right now and try and communicate what an exciting life we're having and what wonderful people we are. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. You made a comment to me on the phone when we were talking about the fact that Gutenberg, the Gutenberg versus the, would you please? Sure. Um, uh, society has basically been right side of the brain, left side of the brain. So uh, there's an argument to say that the right side of the, our brain controls our visual uh, understanding, and the left side is much more textual. Um, so society, early society was formed around right side of the brain thinking. You go to the caveman, you see there's usually drawings of you know, the hunt. Um, when Gutenberg uh, created the typeface, our society shifted from a visual society to a text-based society. Um, and, uh, and indexing and how we, how we communicate, organize our information. Um, and now there's an argument to be said that we are returning back to almost a right side of the brain thinking because now we are just taking pictures and sending it, taking pictures and sending it. Um, I, I think it's a combination of you know, text and image that we're, we're coming back to, but for sure the image is playing a, 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 a fundamental change in the way we are communicating. As if you talk to a 12-year-old person. Linda, do you think these selfies are being taken because people believe they're going to create memories or do you think it's something different than that? I suspect that they're serving different purposes than, than for the goal of this is an important moment and I want to capture, uh, you know, capture it on, uh, 
you know, on film. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of times it really is about about connecting with other people. Um, some of it is narcissism. You know, hey, look at me. Um, you know, but but some of it is is just a form of communication and, and a technology that enables us to share. Um, there is research in in psychology. Um, we like ourselves. It's referred to as implicit egotism. We actually like words that begin with the letters of our first name uh, more than we like words that begin with letters that aren't with our first name. <laughs> um, when we see ourselves in photos, and this actually is a study I'm dying to run. Um, it's a little tricky to figure out how to do. Um, what happens when we look at ourselves in photos? I look to see how I look. And if somebody else is sitting there like this, so, you know, here, take a picture. He's got his eyes closed. I don't care. I'm like, that's a great shot. Look at me. Um, and, and what effect does that have when we focus ourselves on, on, on ourselves, even, even in our photos? Um, you know, they're supposed to be cueing our memories, but they're just feeding into, I wasn't thinking about his experience experience per se. Now the nice thing with the photo is I can go back and see the horrible grimace on your face and be like, wow, he must have had a really bad day that day. So I can go back and reinterpret things. Um, but but I, I do think there is that sort of look at me kind of phenomenon that, that you know is just growing stronger and stronger it seems. I think this technology really enables it to be exploited and I don't think people recognize that from a social perspective, that, that might not be so great to raise our children to think that you know, everybody's a unique snowflake. You know, no, <laughs> we're, we're all special, yes, but, but, but people are people and there's more common amongst us. I would like to just, just as a psychologist and a scientist, right brain, left brain, you know, you're using it as an analogy. You yes. all recognize that it's an oversimplified version of the brain, and I'm sure you do too. I, I simplify everything. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, uh, you know, I mean, I, I the, at ICP, the show I want to do on selfies, because I want to do a show on selfies, because I think it is a question of today. Why are we all taking selfies? But there's another element to this, which is I want my selfie show to be a show, fee, a show that also includes data. Because behind every selfie, which no one's really thinking about at this moment, there is tremendous amounts of data that can be mined, taken, and exploited. Uh, I love the fact that the NSA has just basically gotten destroyed for going, you know, taking all information, following us. But do you realize the NSA was going to Google and, and Facebook and Twitter and trying to get information? Because those are the companies that have the information. When we take a selfie and when we upload it and when we send it around to our friends, there is algorithms right now that can detect whether you have blonde hair, you have glasses. You, have a, you wear red shirts, there's a pattern. You're wearing a lot of red shirts in your selfies. Oh, I'm a company that makes red shirts. I'm going to begin <laughs> to market red shirts to you because I see that you're wearing red shirts. Not like that, but oh, wait a minute. In your selfie, I see the GPS. I know where you are. So I know you wear red shirts and I know where you go and I know the, the patterns that you take. So now when you go from this block to this block at 8.30 in the morning to nine, all the stores are going to basically pay a premium to, to advertise red shirts to me because they know that I'm attracted to the red shirts. That is what's going on behind a selfie, which no one's having a conversation about. And that's the exhibition that we're going to do at ICP. Please come. <laughs> I, uh, I think one thing that's got to be mentioned is that ICP is one of the only organizations that I see kind of embracing that. I see too many trying to say, let's keep, let's keep photography classic. And so I, my hat is off to you for that. Can I pull up slide 28 for one second, one more time? Uh, something bothered me when I saw this photo beyond it itself. This was a funeral of one of the most admired men in the world, and uh, somebody who I admired greatly. Never in the first two months after this was posted did I hear who took it. No. Ever. It was about the photo itself, and it was a French photographer. Yes. Who wants to jump on that one? That's the big. That's the that's the ex exploding uh, question. And well, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, so so I was the director of Magnum, and Magnum was was basically uh, an organization that was set up to protect the photographer's copyright. I mean, that's the genesis of it in 1947, and they felt that if they 
uh, controlled their copyright, they had leverage with the newspapers and magazines, and that they could then control their stories, and they wouldn't be just paid for hire uh, uh, photographers. And it was it, it worked out, and it was it's, it was great. Uh, if you see what Getty Images has recently done, uh, they basically took all their images and they've basically sent them out and said, uh, you know, well. I don't know how many millions, but millions of images. They say you can use these images for free. Um, but what we'd like to do is just embed a little code on your blog or on your site. Um, and I believe that they're going to monetize their images not by licensing images, but by data collection, because um, they're embedding that code and they'll do an advertisement on your site, but also they'll be mining what's going on on, on, on your site and selling that back. The digital residue that, is, that we are all creating is more valuable than a license of that image. Um, uh, to be in the licensing business is a very tough business to be in. It's a big question that a lot of pros deal with. And frankly, as cameras get more sophisticated and it's easier to take high quality pictures, even uh, amateur photographers are finding their images in print ads Every time you upload a photo, there's a risk that somebody gets it. There are vehicles out there to help people copyright. There are apps on your cell phone. You can copyright your Instagrams. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is, it is a burning issue. So unfortunately, we could probably spend another three hours. I could spend another three hours. <laughs> We're out of time. And uh, I would just really like to thank my panelists. Uh, right. uh, yeah. It's just a phenomenal conversation. Thank you.